Okay, thank you very much, and thanks to uh, Matt and the others for inviting me to come here. Uh, this presentation has two parts. In the first part, I'm going to talk about evaluations, what that is, evaluations on sets and on functions. And in the second part, I'll talk about applications and challenges. So you're probably wondering, what is evaluation? Evaluation is one of the key words for this talk. Evaluation is a notion of size. That's the basic definition. In particular, at first, we'll talk about valuations on sets. So if I have a collection S of subsets of n-dimensional Euclidean space, then a valuation on this set is simply a function that assigns a real number to each set. And the, the key property that evaluation has is this property right here. The valuation of a union of two sets is equal to the valuation of one set plus the valuation of the other minus that of the intersection whenever the intersection and the union are themselves in the collection of sets. And this is called the additive property. It's also called the inclusion-exclusion property. You may have seen it in, in combinatorics, but, but just again, if I, have, if I know the valuation of set A and the valuation of set B, and also the valuation of their intersection, then I know the valuation of their union. This is the key property that evaluation has. Evaluation might have some other properties. The evaluations we're going to talk about do have these properties. The first one is evaluation is Euclidean invariant if it's unchanged by rigid motions of the set. So if I have this set A and I, I know its size, so to speak, the size doesn't change if I translate or rotate the set uh, in Euclidean space. It's invariant under isometries, we could say. The next property is that evaluation is continuous if it's if a small change in the set results in a small change in the valuation of the set. Uh, I'm not going to say a lot about what I mean by a small change. I think our intuition is pretty good. To define small would, would require a lot more discussion about things like the Hausdorff metric on sets. Um, but here's an example. If I take this set A and I, I perturb it a little bit, so set B is almost the same thing as, as set A, they have uh, sets A and B in this picture are close in the Hausdorff metric. Basically, that means that if I take a small epsilon neighborhood of, of A and a small epsilon neighborhood of B, then these epsilon neighborhoods contain the other set. If you know about Hausdorff metric, great. If not, uh, think about you know, the intu intuition behind this picture. But if, if A and B are close, say, in the Hausdorff metric, then their valuations are also close. If you perturb a set a little bit, Evaluation doesn't change very much. So, this is a really painfully naive question, but so far up till now, I was thinking the vague measure is my notion of valuation. Yes. But is that also continuous? With yes. Okay. So, that's, that's actually the first example. I was just going to ask can anyone think of evaluation? And the vague measure is probably the first thing you would think of, or I could say the slide says volume. So, volume is a map from, well, at least. Lebesgue measurable sets to the reals. Uh, it is additive, satisfies inclusion and exclusion. It is Euclidean invariant. Volume doesn't change if you slide a set somewhere else. And it's, it is continuous, um, at least for, um, I guess I should say, at least for, for compact convex sets or finite unions of them. Um, for more general sets, that's actually not, yeah, it's not continuous. That's what so, I, I yeah. guess I think with myself is just the big measurable right. set. So if I have all the rational points in the ball, that's close in distance right. to the ball. Is that right? That's How true. Yeah. Um, <coughs> okay, so that's a, that's a, so we don't so anyway. If we restrict our notion of sets, then it's Right. It's it's difficult to be precise enough about uh, continuity in this in this sense. But um, throughout the talk we're going to sort of exclude sets that are like fractals or that contain infinitely many connected, or, yeah, infinitely many connected components. Um, we, really, we should be working in something like an O minimal structure, which I don't really want to go into. But it's basically a way of restricting ourselves to sets with finitely many connected components that are not infinitely complicated. Another example of evaluation is Euler characteristic, and I have to be careful how I define Euler characteristic here. Let me define 
a version of Euler characteristic for a finite simplicial complex uh, that contains AI open simplices of dimension I. So just to, to review, A0 would be the number of vertices in my simplicial complex, A0 or A1 the number of edges, A2 the number of open faces, and so on. So if I, if I build anything out of uh, open simplices like this, then the Euler characteristic, which I denote by chi, the Euler characteristic of this simplicial complex is the alternating sum of the number of simplices in each dimension. Uh, this version of Euler characteristic satisfies the additive property. Unfortunately, it's, it's not a homotopy invariant, so you might not like it very much, but this is the, what we might call the combinatorial Euler characteristic. It agrees with the standard topological Euler characteristic on uh, compact convex sets, for example. Um, but, but we could also uh, de define this for sets that are not necessarily closed, and it still satisfies the additive property on such sets. Lebesgue volume is evaluation. Euler characteristic, in this sense, is evaluation. And it turns out that, that Lebesgue volume and Euler characteristic are special cases of a family of valuations called the intrinsic volumes. Let me try to tell you what the intrinsic volumes are. If I have a, a, a tame set in an n-dimensional set, then there are n plus 1 intrinsic volumes defined on such a set, and they're denoted mu0 through mu n. These are the, the n plus 1 intrinsic volumes. They're continuous uh, Euclidean invariant valuations on on tame subsets of R. So again, tame, we're not allowing fractals, we're allowing things like uh, compact convex sets or polygons or things like that. And so what are these what are these valuations? Well, mu n is the n-dimensional Lebesgue volume. On the other end of the spectrum, mu zero is the Euler characteristic in the way that I uh, just described it. What are the ones in the middle? The, the mu n minus 1 valuation is related to the n minus 1 dimensional surface area. In fact, it's half the, the surface area. Uh, I'll say in a moment why it's half. Down here, mu 1 is basically the, the, the mean width. It's the idea is that the subscript sort of indicates the dimension of the valuation. So mu k, for k between 0 and n, gives a notion of the k-dimensional size of the set. So you can see that Euler characteristic is sort of the zero-dimensional size. Euler characteristic extends our notion of counting. Up here, we have the n-dimensional size, un. The surface area is the n minus one dimensional size. Width is sort of the, the one-dimensional size. It's like a length. So we can, we can define a notion of k-dimensional size for any k between 0 and n, where n is the, the dimension of the set that we're looking at. Um, the reason why these are called intrinsic volumes is because they are intrinsic to the set itself and don't depend on the dimension of the space in which the set may be embedded. So if I, if I have a three-dimensional cube or something, and I look at it as a subset of a high-dimensional space, the intrinsic volumes don't depend on the high dimension of the ambient space. The normalization is what makes them independent of the ambient space. So we normalize, for example, mu n minus 1 to be half the surface area, and that's important to make it uh, independent of the dimension of the ambient space. Let me give you a, a concrete example about how you can uh, think about these intrinsic volumes. This is the simplest case I know of in which I can state concretely uh, what the intrinsic volumes are. So if I have a, a box or a... Uh, uh, an n-dimensional box, and I know the side lengths, then the intrinsic volumes of this object, and this, by the way, this box is, is closed, and it's, uh, it's convex. The intrinsic volumes of this are given by the elementary symmetric polynomials. So, for example, mu0, again, this is the Euler characteristic. In this talk, I'm going to use mu0 mu and chi interchangeably to refer to Euler characteristic. This is zero dimensional or zero degree elementary symmetric polynomial, which is one. One is the Euler characteristic of that. The, the mu one valuation is the first degree elementary symmetric polynomial. 
on these variables. It's a sum of the side lengths. This is a, think of it as the length of the box, if you will. And so on. And so on, until we get to the nth degree symmetric polynomial is a product of all the side lengths. And of course, that's the n-dimensional volume of the box. So, um, and notice, if this box is three-dimensional, then mu2, in fact, gives me half the surface area. So, if my, if my set of, or my collection of sets consists of finite unions of objects like this, then suppose I take this box and remove one of the faces, I can compute the intrinsic volume of the resulting object by additivity. So I know the intrinsic volume of the closed box, I know the intrinsic volume of, say, this face. If I take the face off, I just subtract, and I can find the intrinsic volumes of the box with a face missing. So, can I sure. So, if I consider the open n dimensional box yes. here instead of closed, you right. would still agree in the n dimensional volume. Yes. But the, would all the other ones change? I know the Euler characteristic might change, right? Yeah. Uh, so, if I, if I remove all of the faces, and I just have the, the open box. The Euler characteristic will be plus or minus one, depending on the dimension. The highest dimensional intrinsic volume will not change, like you said. And the other ones, uh, in general, they will change. And the way I figure out what they are is by using the additivity property, the inclusion exclusion. And I might have to apply it you know, multiple iterations. I might have to, I would subtract the, the closed faces, and then I have to add back in the closed edges and so on. Right. Here's another way that I can define the uh, the intrinsic volumes. This is a, a more general way. For for a tame set in R n, I can define the kth intrinsic volume by this formula. So what am I doing? I'm integrating over the the affine Grassmannian of n minus k dimensional planes in R n, scaled appropriately, and I'm taking each plane and intersecting it with my set K, then the integrand is the Euler characteristic of that intersection. This formula is called Hadwiger's formula. Yeah, that makes sense, yes. Yeah, so, makes sense. Yeah. so, so this, yeah. this is the definition in a, in a much more general case. Um, this works whenever the Euler characteristic is defined for all such intersections of planes with my set. Let me give you an illustration. Suppose this is my set K. I like to know the intrinsic volume of it. I take an n minus k dimensional plane P, or I take all such planes, suppose I just look at the vertical ones for now. I look at how they intersect my set. For example, this plane intersects, if k is a closed set, and intersects on this closed interval, the Euler characteristic of the intersection is one. That's what I'm integrating here. As I keep sliding to the right, now the intersection has, has two closed intervals. Euler characteristic is two. Integrating two, and then I do this for for all the planes in all other directions too. Right, so for a set that has a lot of symmetry, this is easy. For a set that doesn't, this is really hard. But uh, but this is a more general definition. Okay. The intrinsic volumes also show up in a rather different context. This is, um, in fact, how they're often defined for for convex compact sets. Suppose I have a convex compact set in, in the plane, and suppose I look at a tube of radius r around this set. So this just means all the points that are uh, at most distance r from my set k, the tube. And I'd like to know, what is the area of this tube? Well, let's think about this. So mu k, since this is a two-dimensional set, mu k is the area of the tube. Uh, how can I figure out the area of this tube? Well, certainly, it contains k, so let's let's start with the area of k. The area of set k. Then I have to figure out the area of the part around k. So, well, I can proceed by looking at uh, the area of these rectangles. These are just rectangles along the sides of k. And if I think about this, the area of these four green rectangles, I realize the total area here in green is really just the perimeter of k times r, which I can write like this. This is mu1 is half the perimeter, because it's normalized in a particular way. So 2 mu1 is the perimeter, 
and then I multiply that times r. So this is the area of the green rectangles. And then what's left? Well, I have the, the sectors of the circle in purple. And I notice that, in fact, if I put them together, they are actually a whole circle. Uh, so I have the remaining area which I need to count is, in fact, the area of a circle of radius r, which I can write this way. This is kind of weird. Uh, I've written it in terms of mu zero. This is really just one, because k is a compact convex set of all the characteristic one. But the point is that I can write the volume of this, or the area of the tube, as a polynomial in the radius. And that's uh, probably surprising if you've never seen this before. The volume, or the area of the tube, is a polynomial in R whose coefficients involve the intrinsic volumes. And this is true in a much more general sense. If I have a, a higher dimensional set K, then as long as it's uh, compact and convex, then I can write the, the volume of its tube in terms of this polynomial where omega is the volume of a unit ball and mu is the intrinsic volumes which you've seen before. And this is called the Steiner formula. And in some books, this is the definition of the intrinsic volumes for uh, compact convex sets. You may also see versions of a formula much like this that's called the, the Weyl tube formula, W-E-Y-L. Okay. Any questions about this? Okay, so one thing that's, that's really nice about the intrinsic volumes is that if we understand the intrinsic volumes, in fact, we pretty much understand all uh, Euclidean invariant continuous valuations on sets. And the statement of, of the theorem that says this is Hadwiger's theorem. So Hadwiger's theorem says that the intrinsic volumes actually form a basis for the vector space of valuations, really I should say, continuous Euclidean variant valuations on nice sets in Rn. Uh, the fact that there is a vector space of valuations is not something we should necessarily take for granted. But, but there is a vector space, and the intrinsic volumes form a basis. So what that means is, and here's a, a more precise statement of the theorem, if I have any valuation V that's a continuous Euclidean invariant valuation on, on tame, you can replace tame with compact convex if you like, or with polygons or whatever, uh, then this valuation is actually a sum of the intrinsic volumes multiplied by some constants that depend on the valuation. So this is a sense in which the valuation is a linear combination of the intrinsic volumes. So if you understand the intrinsic volumes, then in a sense, you understand all notions of size for subsets of Rn. And uh, you can answer questions like the one posed in this paper. The title of this paper is, what is the length of a potato? Which doesn't make sense. Maybe half an hour ago, this question would not have made sense. Maybe now it does. The length of a potato is the mu1 intrinsic volume of the potato. And so Stephen Shanuel wrote this paper like 30 years ago. It's actually a really nice paper. If you want to know more about the intrinsic volumes, and I would highly recommend you find this paper online. And uh, it's, it's just a really delightful short paper um, in which he argues that mu1 is the proper interpretation of length for irregularly shaped objects like potatoes. So just to emphasize this again, uh, if I ask you how big is this set, okay, it's three potatoes, mm -hmm. well now we know how to interpret this. We might say the size of this set is the volume of the potatoes. Maybe the volume is, is 763 cubic centimeters. Or we might say the size is the area. Or we might say the size is the length, where I mean length in a very precise way. The, the mu1 of, of this set. Or we might say it's the number, the Euler characteristic. There are three potatoes. Or in fact, we could have any linear combination of these. But that's it. If our, if our notion of big means that uh, we're talking about a Euclidean invariant continuous valuation, then the linear combinations of these things are the only answers to this question. Any questions? Yes. Yes. So Hadwiger proved this theorem, uh, I think, in the 50s, but I might be wrong about that. And his original papers are in German, so they're, I don't know, probably harder for most of us to read uh, than things like Sean Newell's paper. 
Yeah, so the, this, uh, this discussion about the, the nice sets of reward, if you fix a class of sets and then all the evaluations on that class consist of form a vector space? Yes. Is that the right order? In the yes. Okay. Right. Yeah, and Hadwiger worked in the setting of, uh, as far as I know, of uh, convex compact sets. Mm -hmm. um, there's a book by Klein and Rota that, that um, work in the setting of polyconvex sets, so that's like uh, finite unions of convex sets including things like polygons. Um, but this is also true in a more general setting, like in the, in the O-minimal structure, which I'm not really going to go to. But we can talk about that later if you like. OK. So hopefully we understand something about the intrinsic volumes, which are evaluations on sets. So now let's talk about evaluations on functions. If I have a function, what can I say about the size of a function? So let me, let me define what I mean here. Evaluation on functions is an additive map from tame functions to the real. So again, uh, tame functions essentially means that all the level sets or the super level sets of the function are tame sets. So it's certainly fine if all the level sets of my function are convex, compact, uh, super level sets. But, but again, this can all be defined in a more general context as well. What I want to avoid is functions who have level sets that are fractals or infinitely complicated sets. And in this setting, additive means the following. It means that the valuation of f plus the valuation of g is equal to the valuation of the pointwise max of f and g plus the valuation of pointwise min. Slightly different than the union intersection formula, but this is how I can write additivity for functions. And this is equivalent to the statement here that evaluation of f is equal to the valuation of f restricted to some set A plus the valuation of f restricted to the complement of A. Equivalent. So let me uh, talk about the two properties, Euclidean invariance and continuity. Evaluation on functions is Euclidean invariant if, if it's independent of how I slide the function around its domain. So if I have this function f, and I translate it or, or you know, rotate the domain or something, uh, the valuation doesn't change. That's what Euclidean invariant means in this context. And evaluation is continuous if a small change in f results in a small change in the valuation of f. So if that's my function f and I perturb it a little bit, I'll obtain a function g. If f and g are close in, in some metric, then their valuations are close. Uh, this is, is even more difficult to say what we mean by close. Um, I'll point out a paper later that, that talks about certain topology to, to make this precise. But, um, but again, I think our intuition is pretty good that if I perturb f a little bit, then it should result in a small change in the valuation. I'm not thinking the, the usual kind of metric that LP or something like that? Uh, no, okay. <laughs> because strange things happen for um, for the integrals that I'm going to describe, like the Euler integral. There'll be an example towards the end that, that um, addresses that. So uh, let me give you, well, I should have asked. Can anyone think of an ev evaluation on functions? The first thing you might have said is the Lebesgue integral is evaluation on functions. So it's certainly a map from at least Lebesgue measurable functions to the reals, and it satisfies these three properties. So if I have a function f, of course, the Lebesgue integral is the area under the curve. Uh, the Lebesgue integral is additive in this sense. If I have two functions, f and g, the integral of f plus the integral of g is, in fact, the integral of the pointwise max plus the integral of the pointwise min. The Lebesgue integral is also Euclidean invariant. It doesn't matter if you translate or rotate the domain or whatever. It doesn't take the integral. And it is, it is continuous in, in some precise sense. Um, we could have a whole hour talking about continuity of, of such valuations, but, but we don't have time for that. So let's look at another example of evaluation on functions. How about something called the Euler integral? Uh, this is something that was, has been popularized in recent years in the applied topology community by Rob Price my thesis advisor, and Yuli Rushnikov. So suppose I have, have a, a tame set, 
has a well-defined Euler characteristic in Rn. And I look at the, the indicator function on this set, 1a indicator function, has value 1 on a and 0 otherwise. I could define the Euler integral of such a function, which I'm going to denote by d chi, as an integral using Euler characteristic as a, as a measure, if you will. And this Euler integral is equal to the Euler characteristic of a. This, uh, this is what it should be, right? If I'm using Euler characteristic as a measure and integrating an indicator function, then this better be equal to the Euler characteristic of the set determines the indicator function. I can proceed by looking at functions on our end that have finite, say, integer valued range. I mean, finite range, not just bounded. There are finitely many elements in the range. Uh, any function like this can be written as a sum of indicator functions on, on sets. And I can express the Euler integral in this way. I sum over all integers c in the range. I multiply the value by the Euler characteristic of the set on which the function takes that value. So I'm going to use this sort of notation, this bracket f equals c, to mean the set on which the function takes the value c. Let me give you a, a, a concrete example. So here is such a function. It has finite range, find on the reals, takes values in the integers, has only three values in the range. Uh, or you can also say it's, it's zero for all points where this graph is not drawn. Zero elsewhere. And I don't care about the places where it's zero. So uh, here's, my, here's my formula. Let's compute the Euler integral of this function just to see how this works. I look at the set on which the function has value 1, and I see that this set consists of two open intervals and two uh, vertices. So this is its not a simplicial complex. It's uh, its closure would be a simplicial complex. But, but my explanation of Euler characteristic allows me to say the Euler characteristic of this set is zero because it's two vertices minus two edges. So I'm going to multiply the value times Euler characteristic. And then I'm going to add uh, the value from the next set. So this set consists of two open edges and one vertex. The Euler characteristic is one minus two. That's minus one multiplied by the value of two. And then I go to the third level set. This set consists of three vertices minus one edge. Euler characteristic is two. It's also two closed connected components. We multiply the value times the Euler characteristic. And then I sum over all these things, and I see I get four. And so the Euler integral of this function is four. It's just a number that I assign to the function. At this point, that's what it is. We'll talk about how we can interpret it soon. Okay, so this makes sense for functions that have finite range. What if I have a continuous function? Here is a, a continuous function. What is the Euler integral of a continuous function? Well, here's a really uh, sort of naive idea. What if I approximate this continuous function by a step function? I just take the floor function with um, greatest integer less than or equal to the value of the function. This is an integer value function. I know what its Euler integral is. And then maybe I just make the step size smaller. And I compute the Euler integral of this function. I look at the limit as the step size goes to 0. So I, I take the floor function uh, of the function multiplied by some m. And then I compute the Euler integral divided by m. Look at the limit as m goes to infinity. This limit exists, but in fact, I made a choice when I defined this. You might say, well, why did we choose the lower step function instead of the upper one? Why did we choose the floor instead of the ceiling function? And uh, or I could say, does it matter if we use upper or lower step function approximations? In fact, it does matter. And the, the, the limits don't agree. The limit involving the floor function is sometimes different and the limit involving the ceiling function. So this is somewhat problematic, but also really interesting. So in fact, I define two Euler integrals for continuous functions. I have the lower Euler integral, which is what I just illustrated on the previous slide, and the upper Euler integral, which is practically the same thing, but using the ceiling function instead. And so my notation for these integrals, I just put 
floor or ceiling brackets around the pi to indicate which integral I'm talking about. These limits exist, but are not equal in general. So I get this sort of dual theory of integration. The duality is the, the difference between floor and ceiling. We'll see uh, how the duality manifests itself uh, throughout the rest of this talk. Yes? Are these two notions sort of extremal in some sense? Extremal. Like, can you, can you get anything uh, larger or smaller than these, or is everything else in between? Um, is there other notions of defining yes. than upper and lower, right? Well, so, so these two integrals are valuations in the sense I've been describing. You could scale them however you like, and you'd still have a valuation. I don't know if that answers the question. I can say a lot of times for, say, continuous functions, these integrals either agree or they're negatives of each other. So if you want to, say, average them, it gets zero a lot of times, which is not very interesting. Um, for functions that are not continuous, these integrals are not necessarily negatives of each other. But for a class of continuous functions, they are. Yes? So if, uh, if you take, if you approximate from below the step, with different step functions, so not just the floor here that you indicated, oh. does that make it to one of these? Uh, That's sort of the question. I see. So if you use a step function that's not as regular, like it. So I guess another approximating sequence. Another yeah. yeah. I think if you have any approximating sequence that, that is a lower step function, that, like so for this function, mm -hmm. all the lower integrals are like half open except for this one up there, then the limit would be the same. So it doesn't actually matter if the steps are all equally sized or what. Um, I can say that. Maybe that answers the question better. I don't know. Another question? Okay, so we get this, this dual theory of integration. Uh, another way to express these integrals is as follows. I can express them in terms of Riemann integrals like this. The lower Euler integral is a Riemann integral over the positive reals of the set, the Euler characteristic of the set on which f is greater than or equal to each s minus the Euler characteristic of the set on which f is less than minus s. Let me draw a picture to illustrate this. This is my function f. I look at each s from 0 to infinity. There's some s. And I say, ah, this is the set on which the function is greater than or equal to s. It has Euler characteristic 1 in this case. And then I also have to look at minus s. And I get a, the set on which s is, or f is less than minus s is an open integral, open interval in this case. And so then I integrate overall s from 0 really to the maximum, the, the maximum of f and minus s is all I have to, have to go to. Uh, so this is a nice way of computing the Euler integral in practice. And then what is the upper integral? Well, it's almost the same, except I've replaced greater than or equal to with greater than and less than with less than or equal. So this is another manifestation of this duality, the duality between greater than or equal or just greater than. So in the upper integral, I have an open interval up here and a closed interval down there. This is a handy formula uh, in practice. Let's, let's apply this formula and give a, a, a concrete example. If I have this function, what is the Euler integral? Well, this function only has positive values or non-negative values. So I just have to think about this integral here. So I say, all right, what if I start at 0 and I look at the super level sets of this function? Well, for any value of s between 0 and 1, the super level set is a closed interval, which has Euler characteristic 1. I'm integrating 1 from 0 to 1. And then for any s between 1 and 2, I get two closed intervals. I'm integrating 2 between 1 and 2. And then for any s between 2 and 3, I again get a single closed interval. So uh, I'm integrating 1 between 2 and 3. And now I'm done, because the function doesn't have any values higher than 3. So I add these up, and I get 4. So in fact, the Euler integral of this function is also 4. That's the Euler integral. Uh, and what you might notice, if you think about this, is that really, this Euler integral only depended on the critical points of the function. Like, 
the only places where these super level sets changed was when I passed the critical points of this function. Let's think about that again. When I passed this critical point, the super level set transitioned from one closed interval to two, and then back to one, which is zero. Uh, so I can actually make a connection to Morse theory here. I can say that this lower integral is equal to the sum of the maximum values of the function minus the sum of the minimum values. Let's look at this example. Here I have a maximum value at 3 minus a minimum value at 1 plus a maximum value at 2. And again, I get 4. And this is true in a more general sense as well. Let me tell you what I mean. If I have a Morse function, so that's a function that has uh, no degenerate critical points and uh, all critical points have different uh, values, different functions, different values at each critical point, then if I know the Morse index of the critical points, then I can say what the Euler integral is. So if you don't know what Morse index is, I'll give you a simple example. If these are graphs of functions from R2 to R, then if I look at the critical points, the Morse index is the number of negative eigen eigenvalues of the Hessian matrix of second derivatives at each critical point. Or you can think of it as the number of, or the dimension of the space on which you can, what am I trying to say? The dimension of the subspace of the tangent space at which you can flow downhill at each critical point. So you cannot flow downhill at all from this critical point. It has Morse index zero. From this saddle point, you can flow downhill in, in only uh, one way. And from this point, you can flow downhill on a, in any direction in a two-dimensional space. So it has Morse index 2. This might be familiar to some of us. OK. So if we know what the Morse index is, and we have a Morse function, then we can express the Euler integral in terms of a sum over the critical points of negative 1 either to the Morse index or the Morse co-index is what this is. This is just the, the dimension of the range of the domain minus the Morse index. So I just have to know the value of the function of the critical points and the Morse index. And this is just a more general version of what I said before for a two-dimensional uh, function in R2. This becomes, um, you know, sum of the values of this type of critical point minus sum of the values of this type of critical point plus sum of the values of this type of critical point. So this is really nice. The, the Euler integral only depends on, on the critical points. And in fact, the Euler integral is a valuation on functions in the way I described. It is additive in this sense. It is invariant under Euclidean motions of the domain. And uh, if you perturb the function in a small sense, you, you don't change the, the Euler integral. OK. And in fact, th there's, well, there are some things special about Euler characteristics. But there's nothing particularly special in the sense that, that we can define similar integrals with respect to any of the intrinsic volumes. If we have a function with finite range, we can replace Euler characteristic by any of the intrinsic volumes and define what we call the Hodwiger integrals of, of a function. And then we express the Hodwiger integrals of continuous functions in exactly the same way as the Euler case, just replacing Euler characteristic by whatever intrinsic volume you like. If we choose the n-dimensional, the top-dimensional uh, intrinsic volume, we get back the Lebesgue integral. And the duality disappears in that case. But in any other dimension, we have this duality of, of two different integrals. These integrals can be expressed in various ways. Let me just draw two pictures to illustrate this. Uh, I can express the Euler integral in this way, in terms of a Lebesgue integral over level sets. This is similar to the formula I had for the Euler integral. Or I can do this thing that, that reminds us of Hadwiger's formula. I integrate over the, the affine Grassmannian of the domain, and I look at the Euler characteristic of the intersection. So really, the, the Euler integral of the intersections. And I can express or compute Hadwiger integrals this way. Let me give you a quick example 
if I look at this function on R2, this is like a, a paraboloid, then uh, what are the Hadamard integrals of this function? Well, the, the super level sets have radius root 4 minus s, and so uh, the Euler integral turns out to be 4. The, the lower mu 1 integral turns out to be 16 pi over 3, and the this is really the Lebesgue integral turns out to be 8 pi. So really, these numbers give me different notions of the size of this function. That's really the, the key idea with these uh, Hadamard integrals. They tell us about the size of a function. And we find that there is a version of, yes? That's okay. Is there a notion of differentiation for these other integrals? Um, I'm not aware of, of such a thing. Perhaps there is. I think that's a good question. Yeah. Um, but we obtain a version of Hadwiger's theorem for functions, and this is kind of a, a not incredibly precise statement of it because this word cont continuous um, hides a lot of information. But in general, if you have any Euclidean invariant continuous valuation on functions, you can write it as this type of combination of the integrals with respect to the intrinsic volumes. So similar form to Hadwiger's theorem for functions, this was proved by uh, by myself with Rob Grice and Mueller Vershkov. Isn't it generalized the theorem? Yes. Yes. So, for example, if if f is an indicator function of a set, then you get back the regular Hadwiger theorem. So, if you'd like to know more about this. You can, you can refer to the following paper. Uh, so now you know something about how to measure the size of a function. You do it by using these Hadwiger integrals. And here's a paper um, that goes into a lot more technical detail about, about this topic. I'll show you the, the reference for this again at the end. So how much time do we have left? I think I'm almost five out of minutes. time. Okay, we'll spend five minutes talking about applications and challenges. I think we'll, we'll be able to to go through the, the nicest application of, of these things. So the application is to surveillance or, or target enumeration. Suppose I have a bunch of sets in some workspace in the plane, those sets, and I have a function that counts the number that exists at each point. There's the values of my function. Uh, the Hodwiger integrals provide information about this collection of sets. So it, loosely, the Euler integral gives a count, the mu1 integral gives a length, the mu2 integral gives an area, and so on. Very much analogous to the intrinsic volumes. And in fact, I don't have to think about upper or lower here because my function is, is uh, integer value, which is nice. So let's, let's look at an example. The Euler integral of f. Uh, I can compute it in this way. This is the, very similar to what I had before, so I just have to know the Euler characteristic of the set on which the function is at least one, it's minus one. This is one connected closed set with two holes. One minus two, that's one way of computing the Euler characteristic. The set on which the function has value at least two has three connected components, as does the set on which it has value at least three. There's only two connected components where the function has value at least four, and then that's it. So I add up these values and I find the sum is seven which is the Euler integral. And in fact, there were seven objects here. It might be hard to count them, but we can color them. So there's the first one, and the second one, third one, fourth one, the fifth one, the sixth one, and the seventh one. So now you see there, in fact, are seven objects. So you might ask, well, is this a coincidence? Does, you know, does the Euler characteristic always give you, does the Euler integral always give you the count? Well, it does, as long as the sets have, the objects, have the same Euler characteristic. So I could say, in general, if I have a collection of, of subsets of Rn with a counting function, then the Hodwiger integral of the counting function gives the sum of the intrinsic volumes of the, of the sets. I don't have much time to go through the proof. Sorry about that. Uh, so in this example, all the sets have Euler characteristic 1, so the, the Euler integral, in fact, gives the number of sets. And so this is useful for uh, target enumeration as 
on a few Libras and Kabbalah that Rob Gretz have written about. Now, the problem is that in practice, we don't really know the value of this counting function at every point in the domain. Uh, a more practical setting is we might have a network of sensors that count how many objects there are at each point where there's a sensor. And these sensors are connected in some way, maybe by proximity, something like that. So the question is, can we compute the Euler integral if we know only the values on this network of sensors? Well, let's get started. We have, want to find the Euler characteristic of the set on which the function is at least one. Well, that's the network of sensors that are counting at least one thing. And the Euler characteristic is some large negative number, because there's a lot of holes. So this, this method is not going to work. But it turns out that we can, we can express the Euler integral in terms of the Betty numbers, the number of connected components of these sets, these super level sets and the sublevel sets. And the proof involves the homological definition of Euler characteristic along with Alexander duality. And uh, we put these together and we find this formula. I only have like one more minute, so let's, uh, you can, you, the proof is in the references at the end if you want to see it more. So, I can, I can compute the Euler integral just by knowing the connected components of these super and sub-level sets. I have to add the one at each step. That's from the Alexander duality. If I look at the set on which it's at least two, and then less than two, and so on. At least three, less than three, and so on. And what I find is that when I add up all these numbers, I again get seven. That's all right, this is nice. This is nice. I can compute the integral in this network case as long as I know the, the connectivity. And this works as long as the network is dense enough. Now, what does that mean, that it's dense enough? Well, that's, that's a good question, and it's difficult to make the precise. Um, this is an area where I think there's, there's um, much opportunity for research involving stochastic geometric models of such things to provide some probabilistic arguments for it. If I know that my objects are, uh, you know, ha conform to some size distribution, then I can say if my network is is this dense, then with high probability, I sample the connectivity appropriately. So, I think uh, this is something that I hope to work on in the near future. Okay, well, I think I'm probably out of time. Maybe you can take a time to ask if people have questions. Yeah. Sure. Here are the references. Um, so this paper here that's highlighted is, is my paper with Robin Yuli that, that um, goes into a lot more technical detail. Here's the paper by Chen Yuel, which is a really nice paper to read. And then um, if you want to know more about the target enumeration stuff, the top paper there by Vrishnikov and Christ. Is also a really nice paper to read. So target enumeration seems like a natural um, application of Euler characteristic integration. Do you guys yes. have any uh, proposed applications uh, for the higher yeah. Hadleger integrals? Um, so you could actually use any of the Hadleger integrals to do target enumeration if you know that all of your targets have uh, some constant evaluation in any dimension. So suppose, if I know that the mu1 intrinsic volume of all the targets is constant, then if I compute the integral with respect to mu1, I'll get whatever that constant is times the number of targets. So I could do target enumeration in that case as well. Um, another application of the, of the Hodwiger integrals is if I'm not necessarily interested in the count of the targets, but in something like the, the length of the targets, or the average area, or something like that, maybe for high dimensional targets, perhaps. Um, the the Hadwiger integrals would be useful in that case as well. Other applications which I would hope to talk about were um, image processing and, and cell dynamics. The intrinsic volumes are useful to some extent in these areas, and it seems like the Hadwiger integrals would also be useful um, in a functional setting. Yes. 
I wish there was, the, um, but I don't know any. It's because the, the integrals with respect to the higher intrinsic volumes require a metric structure. The Euler integral is the only one that's a purely topological integral. Um, all the other ones require some notion of distance. Um, and it seems like you cannot reduce them to critical points. I wish you could. But I think th there may still be interesting things to be discovered about um, connections between those higher integrals and um, some version of, I don't know, stratified Morse theory or Kidwick integration, things like this that I don't know a lot about. Thank you.